to turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 26. Today I'm going to be reading from the New International Version. We're picking up today where we left off last week in the middle of a message that is entitled Selfish Prayers. I know that some of you weren't here last week, so I'm going to go ahead and spend the next couple of minutes catching you up so that you're not just completely lost. Last week, I began the service by posing the question, is it okay to pray selfish prayers? Now, what I mean by a selfish prayer is a prayer where we're asking God to do something, not because we think it's what he wants, not because we think it's what's best for the kingdom, not even because we think it's what's best for those around us, but just because we want it. Some examples of selfish prayers are praying that it will snow. Anyone ever do that? Before you go to bed on a Sunday night, you pray that it will snow so that why? So you don't have to go to school or work the next day. I've heard that some of you pray that it will snow on Saturday night so you don't have to go to church. Shame on you. Another selfish prayer might be praying that you get a seat next to the pretty girl in class. Guys, you ever done that? Hudson, did it work this year? Those are examples of selfish prayers. And and last week, I was trying to answer the question, is it okay to pray selfish prayers? And to do so, I pointed you to a couple of passages of Scripture. The first one was in Mark chapter 11. This is a story where Jesus was hungry, and he went up to a fig tree that didn't have any fruit on it because it wasn't time yet. It wasn't the season for it to have fruit. But this made Jesus angry, so he cursed the tree. And the next day, he and his disciples came by, and Peter noticed that the tree had died. And he pointed it out to Jesus. And Jesus used this opportunity to teach the disciples a lesson about prayer. Mark chapter 11, verses 22 through 24 says this, Have faith in God. Jesus says, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they, that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Last week I made the statement that I don't think we could want or desire much more proof that it is okay to pray selfish prayers than that passage right there. Jesus literally tells his disciples that if they just happen to want a mountain to move, that all they have to do is pray and have faith, and it will be done. But just in case there were skeptics in the room last week, we turn to another passage in Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane with Peter, James, and John. He knows that he's soon going to be arrested and he's going to be tried and he's going to be crucified. And he tells his disciples that his soul is overwhelmed with sorrow because of what he's about to have to go through. And then Jesus kneels down to pray. And three times in this story, we're told that Jesus prays essentially the same thing. And that thing is this. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus had come to earth to do one thing primarily. Mark 10, 45 tells us that Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. The whole reason Jesus was here was to do what he was about to have to do. But still, Jesus prayed, Father, if it is possible, don't let this happen to me. If it's possible, Lord, don't make me do this. God, if there's any other way, please don't make me do this. He says, but not my will, but your will be done. I believe Jesus proves to us here that it is okay to pray for selfish prayers. It is okay to pray for what we want. But as I said last week, I believe that there is a right way to do this. And Jesus teaches it, and he illustrates it for us. 
There are four things that Jesus teaches his disciples and illustrates in his own life that I believe are vital when we're praying any prayer, but especially selfish prayers. And the first thing, the thing that we talked about last week that we have to do when we're praying selfish prayers is to put God's will first. We have to put God's will first. We talked about how three times Jesus prayed the same thing, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup be taken from me, but not my will, but yours be done. This is so important. Jesus didn't just say, Father, don't make me do this. I told you that I believe if that's what Jesus had prayed, that God wouldn't have made him do it. But he said, please don't make me do this, but what you want is more important than what I want. This is an example we all need to follow in our own prayer lives. We need to make God's will our focus. If you want to hear more about that point, if you want to hear more about making God's will your focus, I want to encourage you to go find part one of this message on our YouTube channel, Selfish Prayers Part 1, and you can listen to that. But for the rest of the day, we're going to look at three more things that we need to do when praying selfish prayers. And the second thing that we need to do when praying selfish prayers is ask for what we want. Church, we need to ask for what we want. We need to pray specifically. We need to communicate to God what our desire is. God says, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. See, I noticed something that Jesus told his disciples when he was teaching them next to the fig tree. In verse 24 of Mark chapter 11, Jesus says this, whatever you ask for in prayer, everybody say ask. Whatever you ask for in prayer Believe that you have received it and it will be yours. We're supposed to ask for what we want. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've seen people be frustrated over a situation in their life that they've never prayed about. Frustrated with themselves, frustrated with the situation, even frustrated with God about how things are going when they haven't even told him how they wish they were going. I've seen this even in my own kid's life. They'll be sharing a frustration with me, and I almost always ask the same thing. In fact, I think my kids are probably sick of hearing me say this, but they'll be pouring their heart out to me, telling me about a situation, and I'll say, well, have you prayed about it? Well, no, I haven't. I do that because I believe it's important that we tell God what we want. See, Jesus didn't tell his disciples, whatever you want will be yours. He didn't say that. He didn't say whatever you wish for will be yours. He didn't say whatever you tell your friends and your family about will be yours. Whatever you complain about will be yours. He didn't say that. He said whatever you ask for will be yours. Church, I think it's silly that we teach our children to write a letter to Santa Claus to tell him what they want for Christmas but we don't teach them to use their mouth to tell God what they want in their lives. The second thing you have to do is you have to ask for what you want. I think some of us would do well to remember that old song, Jesus on the Main Line. You remember that? You remember back when, when phones, there was a party line, and, and then there was a main line. You, you know, you could, list, you could pick up. We were watching, Christina and I were watching the movie Prancer the other day, and this kid was talking to his girlfriend. I told her, man, whoever was listening on that party line was, was sure enjoying themselves. But Jesus wasn't on a party line, according to this old hymn. Jesus was on the main line. That song would say, Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line. Tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Everybody remember that? Jesus is on the main line now. Beth, you don't remember that? I got to have a talk with Randy Brown. Then there was a course that say, call him up, call him up, tell him what you want. Call him up, call him up, tell him what you want. Call him up, call him up, tell him what you want. Jesus is on the main line now. And then there were about 50 choruses. I mean, you could sing, if you were in revival, you could sing a song all night long that say, if you want a blessing. Yeah, that's say, if you want a healing. If you want the Holy Ghost. 
at the women's singles conference and say, if you want a husband. No, I'm just kidding. They didn't do that. I mean, they may have. I don't know. Tell them what you want. Jesus is on the main line now. Jesus said, tell him what you want. He said, whatever you ask for will be yours. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. I've read Matthew, and Matthew chapter 6 says that our Father knows what we need before we even ask. Yeah, Jesus said that. He sure did. He said, your Father in heaven knows what you need before you even ask. And then he went on to say, ask anyway. There's all sorts of scriptural support for this. John wrote in 1 John 5.15, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have asked that we have what we asked of him. Everybody say ask. John 15, 7, Jesus said, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Everybody say ask. Paul wrote in Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Everybody say present. No, I'm kidding. Say ask. What are we supposed to do? Ask. Ask. The second thing we need to do when praying a selfish prayer is ask for what we want. Just go ahead and ask. Go ahead and tell them what you want. Lord, I want your will, but it'd sure be nice to sit next to that pretty girl all year long. Right, Hudson? Yeah, look at him. He knows. The third thing that we need to do is have faith. You got to have faith. When Peter was shocked at, this, at the fact that this tree that Jesus had cursed had died, he points it out to Jesus, and Jesus quotes the great philosopher George Michael, and he says, you've got to have faith. He told his disciples, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. He goes on to say, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. You gotta believe, you gotta have faith. James talks about faith in James chapter one, verses six and seven. He's talking about praying, he's actually talking about praying for wisdom, and this is what he says. He says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Church, he says when you pray, if you, if you don't have faith, when you doubt, you shouldn't respect to receive anything from the Lord. Listen, I, I, I hate when people use this as a weapon. You know, we've seen televangelists and, and, and different people in different ministries use this as a weapon, but I do have to tell you that I believe wholeheartedly that the reason we don't see more prayers in the church answered today is because we don't have faith. We don't believe he's going to do it. And the reason I believe that is I've been put in situations on the mission field where there's no other choice than to trust in God. And I've seen how people's faith magically jumps from here to here, and all of a sudden healings start happening left and right. I've experienced it. I've seen it. Things that we would, if we were in America, we would go to the drugstore and we would get some Tylenol or we would get some, some ointment to put on it. But when you're on the mission field and there is no drugstore, you turn to God and you have faith. And before you know it, somebody gets healed. I saw this, our children's pastor on one of our mission trips we went on, she went with us and, and she got bit or stung by some kind of bug and before you knew it, her hand was about that big around and it was bright red and she said, Brian, you gotta pray for me and we went over and we prayed and she said, okay, it feels better. Just like that. And that was like the fourth healing on that trip. I'll tell you what, by the time I got home, I was ready to pray for everybody. You gotta have Faith. The fig tree instance wasn't the only story in the Bible where Jesus told us that we could move mountains. There was another instance of this happening in Matthew chapter 17. A man brought his son to Jesus, and his son had a demon that, that, that had possessed him, and it would cause him to have seizures from time to time. And, and the man brought his son to Jesus, and he told him that, this, that these seizures would cause him to fall into the fire, or they would cause him to fall into a body of water, and he was worried about his son's life. And he had brought his son to the disciples first and had them pray for him, and they weren't able to heal him. 
So Jesus gets on to the disciples, and then he casts the demon out of the boy and heals him. And later it says when they were in private, the disciples asked why they hadn't been able to do it. They said, Jesus, why weren't we able to cast out this demon? And Matthew 17, 20, Jesus answers him, and this is what he says, because you have so little faith. Why weren't we able to do it? Because you don't have faith. And then he goes on to tell him, truly, if I tell you, if you have the faith just as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. When we pray, church, it doesn't matter if it's for salvation. It doesn't matter if it's for healing. It doesn't matter if it's for freedom or for nice weather or to sit next to a pretty girl all year long. When we pray, we've got to have faith. Faith is what moves the hand of God. Church, we're, we're told in the book of Luke, actually it's in several gospels, but we're told about Jesus who's approached by a man named Jairus whose daughter is sick. He says, come with me and, and, and heal my daughter. So Jesus is going with Jairus, but they take too long to get there. And while they're on the road, Jairus' servants come to him and they tell him, don't bother the master anymore for your daughter is dead. He received the most devastating news that a father could ever receive. But as soon as he does, Jesus turns to him. In Luke 8.50, it's recorded. He turns to him and he says, listen, don't be afraid. Just believe. And she will be healed. Just believe. All throughout his ministry, Jesus stresses the importance of having faith when we pray. Multiple times he'll heal someone and what he'll say is what? Your faith has made you whole. I think it's silly that so many Christians are walking around, and we have faith that our God created this world that we live in, right? And we have faith that about 2,000 years ago, he sent his son to live on this earth to do a job which was paying the price for our sins. And we have faith that while Jesus was here on earth, that he performed all sorts of miracles. I mean, we're talking he healed blind eyes. He picked up ears that had been cut off and put them back on people's heads. He cursed fig trees and made them die, and then he raised people from the dead. Jesus performed all sorts of miracles, and we have faith, and we believe that. We have faith that he died on a cross to pay the price for our sins. And that three days later, Jesus was raised from the dead. Amen? We have faith in that. And we have faith that because of that atoning work, that we are forgiven for every sin that we have ever committed and every sin we will ever commit, and that we, when we die, will get to go live in heaven with God. Amen? We have faith in all that. We believe all that, but sometimes we struggle to believe that God can take away a headache or that he can allow a stalled engine to start. Or that he can send rain so the crops don't die. Or that he can keep rain away so that the short-sighted bride who planned an outdoor wedding in May doesn't get soaked. We have faith for all the big stuff. But the little stuff, we doubt. It's kind of silly. As Christina comes, when we're praying, even when we're praying selfish prayers, First thing we have to do is we have to put God's will first. The second thing we have to do is ask for what we want. The third thing we have to do is believe that we will receive it. And then the last thing we have to do is accept his answer with joy in our hearts. President Jimmy Carter is quoted as having addressed this topic. Jimmy Carter reportedly said, God always answers prayer. He said, sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. And sometimes he says, you got to be kidding me. Church, when we pray selfish prayers, we have to be willing to accept God's answer, even if it's no. And even if it's, you got to be kidding me. Because we're not always going to get what we ask for. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. You just spent five minutes or so telling us that we should believe we're going to get what we ask for. That's the hard part, right? We have to pray fully 
believing we're going to receive what we've asked for, but also being okay if we don't. We have to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are getting ready to be thrown in a fiery furnace for not bowing down to a golden image, and who said, you know what? Our God will rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. Our God will. But even if he doesn't, we're all right with that. That's the fun part. It's the hard part. And it seems like a difficult pill to swallow if we haven't first mastered the art of putting his will first. Because that's what makes it okay. That's what makes it okay to accept God's answer regardless of what it is. Because if we truly want God's will, then we can ask for the things that we want. That's okay to do. And we can fully expect to get them, but still know that if we don't, it's for the best. That's when we can pray, God, I'd sure love to sit next to that girl all year, all year this year. But I only want it if it's your will. When Christina spoke a couple of weeks ago, which, by the way, didn't she do an awesome job? Man, she, she was phenomenal. I can only let her speak like once a year because if you get any more of that, you're, gonna, you're just going to hate coming and listening to me. In fact, I have proof of that because the week after she spoke, nobody came. But when she spoke, she made a statement. She said, God is not our genie in a bottle. You remember that? It was funny because I was sitting there, and, and sometimes when I'm, when I'm just sitting and I'm thinking, I'm thinking about my sermon that's coming up, and I was like, Lord, she's going to mess up my sermon. I'm getting ready to tell people they can pray for whatever they want. She said, God is not our genie in a bottle. And then she said, thank goodness that she hadn't gotten some of the stuff that she had prayed for. Now, I know she was talking about ex-boyfriends. Thank goodness she didn't get them. It reminded me of a Garth Brooks song from when I was a teenager. You guys ever heard that song? It's a song called Unanswered Prayers. In this song, it talks about, the, the, the author of the song talks about going back to their high school reunion and seeing their high school sweetheart. And it says, uh, it says that when they were younger, each night I'd spend praying that God would make her mine. And then it goes on to basically explain how they didn't really have anything in common anymore and that, that spark wasn't there anymore. He says, we tried to talk about the old days, but there wasn't much we could recall. I guess the Lord knows what he's doing after all. And he says, and as we walked away, I looked at my wife, and then and there I thanked the good Lord for all the gifts in my life. And he says, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Sometimes I thank God that he knows better than I do. And sometimes his answer is going to be no, and I'm all right with that. He says some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. See, the point of that song was that sometimes we don't know what's best for our lives. And it's okay to pray for what we want. Jesus told his disciples, you can pray and you can have that mountain moved. No reason whatsoever. If you want that mountain to be out of the way, you just go ahead and pray and it'll be done. You can pray for the things that you want. As long as you're focused first on God's will and you are okay when you don't get what you prayed for. And the way that we're able to do this is by truly desiring God's will in our lives. Amen? I want what God wants. I've, church, I've prayed that so many times in my life. Some people think it's a cop-out, but I don't. If I'm going for a job or if, you know, if, I, if I'm getting ready to take a big step in my life, all the time I pray, God, if it's your will, open the door. And if it's not, please close it. Because I want your will. I always want to be in God's will. I'll still pray for what I want. Lord, I'd sure love to have that promotion, but only if it's your will. I'll be honest with you, there have been times since we planted this church, like hard, man, there have been some hard days. 
there have been some hard, hard Sunday afternoons where Christine and I have gone home and just cried. And there have been times where I said, God, just let me out of this. Just relieve me from this calling and let me go do something else. But God, I only want that if it's your will. And apparently, sorry for you, it's still his will. If we truly desire God's will, we can be okay when we don't get it. You see, I don't believe that Jesus prayed, Father, please let this cup pass from me and didn't really mean it. Think about that for a minute. I don't believe that Jesus prayed that and didn't believe that God was going to let him out of it. I don't believe that Jesus, who had just spent his entire ministry telling people, you have to have faith, suddenly had a crisis of faith and wasn't able to believe his own prayer. But what I do believe is that over that hour or so that Jesus prayed in the garden, that he prayed for exactly what he wanted. God, don't make me do this. Don't make me do this. And I, I believe that he believed that God was going to let him out of it. But over that hour, I think he began to realize that that was the only way. I believe he meant what he said when he said, Lord, don't make me do this, but what I really want is, is your will. I want to be in your will. I want to please you, God. I want to, I want to do what you want me to do. And so as, after he had prayed for what he wanted, after he had believed that it would be the case, after he had done all that believing, but what I want most is your will, God, Jesus was able to accept the fact that he was still going to have to go through what he had asked to not have to go through. All that being done, Jesus accepted his father's answer. And he did it. And aren't you glad that he did? Church, I told you last week, and I'll say it again, I believe that at any moment in the process, Jesus could have called down angels to deliver him from that process. And he could have been taken away. And our atonement would not have been paid for. Atonement would not have been made. Today we're talking about selfish prayers, and I'm telling you, it's okay to pray selfish prayers. It's okay to pray for nice weather. It's okay to pray to hit all the green lights. It's okay to pray for snow, except for I wish you wouldn't because I hate it. It's okay to pray to sit next to the pretty girl, Hudson. It's okay. As long as you put God's will first, Ask for what you want. Believe that you're going to get it. And accept his answer. Everyone in the room, do me a favor. Bow your head and close your eyes. First thing I want to ask you today is this. There's a chance that you're here and you're mad at God for how things are working out in your life. But you're mad about things you've never even prayed about. If that's you and, and today you say, you know what, I just need God to do a work on my heart. I need him to help me to get over myself. And I need him to help me speak up and tell him what I want. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hand right where you're at. Who else? Thank you. You can put your hands down. Second question I have is this. You're here today and you've been praying. But you've been praying with your mouth and not with your heart. You haven't believed that what you prayed for was going to happen. Church, that's what I call a crisis of faith.
And I'll be honest with you, I'd just as soon somebody not pray for me as pray for me and not believe. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I've been praying, but I haven't had faith, and I need God to strengthen my faith so that I can pray for the little things and I can pray for the big things and I can believe in both cases that they're going to happen. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hand. Who else? Thank you. Put your hands down. Last category is this. You prayed for something and you didn't get it. And now you're mad at God. You're so mad that you've decided you're just going to stop praying. Or you're so mad you've just about decided you're just going to stop going to church. You say, if he's not going to give me what I ask for, then I'm done. Today, if that's you, if you're, if you're here and you say, man, I'm mad at God because he didn't give me what I prayed for. My loved one still died. My husband or wife still left me. I still got fired. I still didn't get the house. I still didn't make the team. I prayed and God still didn't give me what I asked for. And I'm mad. If that's you, I'm here to tell you today that you need... to accept God's answer because he knows better than you do. And you need to ask him to forgive you maybe for some of the things that you've said, maybe some of the thoughts that you've had. If you're here, if you say, I need God to help me, I'm, I'm willing to get over myself. I, I'm willing to get over the issue, but I need God to help me because I'm still mad. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hand. Who is it? I'm going to wait because I know you're here. If you say, you know what, I go around all day long and whenever I think about the Lord, I get a little bit bitter. Because I don't feel like that he gave me what he should have. And I need God to help me. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hand. Lord, I'm so thankful for your word. I'm thankful that you allowed these stories be a part of Jesus' life that was recorded. We know that there's so much about his life that wasn't recorded. But you chose to put this in the scriptures, to put it in the gospels. Lord, I thank you for being a God who answers prayer. And I don't just mean prayers for healing and prayers for salvation, but you're a God who answers all sorts of prayers about big things and small things and serious things and silly things. I thank you for being a God that cares about your people. I thank you that it's okay to pray silly prayers and selfish prayers as long as we do it with the right heart. Lord, I pray that you will help us to put your will first in our lives, just like we prayed about last week. And Lord, I pray that as we vocalize the things that we want and, and verbalize them and ask you for them, God, I pray that you will strengthen our faith. In fact, I pray that you will use the instances where you answer small selfish prayers, that you will use those to strengthen our faith, God. 
so that when the big things come, we have the faith that we need. And Lord, I pray that you will help us when we don't get the answer that we were hoping for. I pray that you will help us to accept that with joy, knowing that you know best. Lord, I'm so thankful for your love. I'm thankful for your presence, and I'm thankful for your power that is at work in our lives, God. I thank you for this word today. Help us, Lord. Do a work in our hearts. Do a work in our minds. In Jesus' name.